This is Picture This, our photography podcast. It's available on YouTube where you can watch it or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. You can just listen to it while you drive or work out or Cook. whatever. Clean. This episode is brought to you, well, we're covering the his, Hasselblad history, which you might not have a Hasselblad camera, but you probably want one. They are really cool. <laughs> they are the coolest, most prestigious cameras ever made. And they have an amazing history that starts with the crash of a Nazi reconnaissance plane during World War II. Uh, it ends up going, literally going to the moon over and over again into space. And then this massive uh, turmoil these financial uh, exchanges where different companies are buying and selling no, them. No spoilers. Uh, okay. This is a fun one. Who makes this possible? Squarespace. Whether you need a domain, website, or online store, make your next move with Squarespace. They have beautiful award-winning designer templates, an all-in-one platform, amazing 24-7 customer support, and you can start your free trial today. Just go to squarespace.com slash Tony and enter the offer code PORTFOLIO to get 10% off of your first purchase. So thank you, Squarespace. Thanks, Squarespace. It started out in 1841. The founding in 1841. The company starts in Gothenburg, Sweden, and it was started by Fritz Victor Hasselblad as a trading company, which I didn't realize. Um, they imported and sold small wares, clothing stuff, sewing items, things like that. And they were made successful by their proximity. They were central to the right. Gothenburg is right on the water. And then, of course, it would be easy from there to ship to the UK, Germany, and a bunch of um, powerful countries around them that would be getting a lot of imports and exporting as well. One of their first famous inventions was a thermos bottle. Not related to photography at all. No, but the thermos actually comes from there? Not thermos the brand, but oh. the concept of the thermos, an insulated drinking vessel. Oh, okay. I could see how people would need that in Sweden to keep things warm. It's cold there all the, all the time. Um, and in 1885? Yeah, so in 1885, I thought it was interesting because it it goes through the family members quite a bit. So you have the founder and then his son, Arvid Hasselblad. Um, he took over in 1871. He was an amateur photographer. He started to bring the photography element in to the company. Mm -hmm. So first it's all about trading. And then he's on his honeymoon with his wife and he meets, he meets George Eastman um, before he founded Kodak. So they start yeah, talking. Like you've heard Eastman Kodak. It's that dude. Yes. <laughs> So before he even started Kodak, he meets Arvid Hasselblad. And just based on a handshake, they say, well, let's have this deal. You can be the sole importer and exporter of Kodak film in Sweden. So just this deal that they made on a handshake lasted 80 years. They began importing photography products and became the principal retailer in Sweden for Eastman Kodak. You think his wife was like, oh our honeymoon and he's talking to some strange like, business American. business business his <laughs> wife is like you said we'd go in the pool <laughs> that's what i'd be thinking um so this is it becomes really popular they're trading film and it becomes a bigger part of the business so much so that they start their own photographic division at the hasselblad trading company um they separated the firm and it was called Hasselbl hasselblad's photographiska ab Catchy name. I'm sure it sounds cooler. And if I said it properly, it probably sounds much Swedish. cooler. <laughs> okay. Uh... We have another family member that takes over. So I'm just kind of rapidly going through these people just because I want to get to this photography stuff. But it does incrementally happen. You have, it starts with film. And then uh, Carl Eric Hasselblad the grandson of the founder, he is raised, he is raising his son, Victor, to completely take over Hasselblad. He has one kid and it's Victor. And he pulls him out of school and he says, you're going to learn about photography and you're going to learn about business in the real world. You're not just going to come into this company. And he sends him out all over to learn about camera, the camera industry and optic 
manufacturing. Yeah, Victor actually like went to Germany and looked at how they were making lenses and stuff. And yeah, so his father important. is like, I think photography is important. I want you to research it for the company. Go out into the world and learn about it. Get some real hands-on experience. Learn about the world. Learn about photography. Get some work under your belt. This is going to be important. So, um, Victor, everybody else is into kind of the trading and business sides of it. But Victor, he's into the mechanics of cameras and birds. Birds. <laughs> like, he loves birds. Yeah, he loves birds, and he just enjoys taking pictures, and he's passionate about the manufacturing. And he's the first one that's kind of going out on his own and has a kind of a new dream for the business, which everyone isn't in on at first. So he goes from Germany and France to the U.S. and he's working in camera and film factories and developing labs, camera shops, anywhere that would provide insight into um, how they could work cameras into the Hasselblad company successfully. His father wanted him to get a broad base of education um, and he wanted him to be successful at running the family business. He sparks up the relationship with um, what's his name? George Eastman from Kodak. Yeah. Remember that? His grandfather made a deal on a handshake. Uh -huh. He starts the relationship over again. He goes all the way to New York to meet up with him. And he's introduced to photographers and technicians. And he's really um, enveloped in this world of photography. I found this photo, if you're watching, of uh, Victor holding a Graflex camera, taking pictures of birds. And Graflex was a Kodak company. So it all kind of ties together. Like he has this relationship with Kodak. He's buying their cameras, taking pictures of birds, developing this long-term relationship. Yeah. I thought it was so cool that there's this family relationship with Kodak that ended up playing such a big part in the Hasselblad history. Um, and in 1935, he actually publishes a photography book uh, and it's a Swedish name, but it means the flight of migratory birds. And most of the pictures were actually taken with uh, Leica because Leica is just the best camera company. And if you have any money at the time, you're buying yourself a Leica. Yeah. It just made the best. And stuff. even though Victor's researching it, there are no cameras made by Hasselblad at this point. Hasselblad is still a trading company. They are trading film, but they're not making anything or anything. No, um, he's just, he just loves it. He's yeah. doing it because he's passionate about it. He's traveling all over the world, Holland, France, Morocco, taking, tracking these rare birds. And if you saw that video clip, he's holding these big dishes, actually recording their sounds because he wants to capture the visuals of them and capture their sounds. I, I think I could get along with Victor. He seems passionate. He likes birds. Yeah, look at him walking around with his gear. <laughs> I know, he's cool. <laughs> and it's not like he was making money at this. I, this no. is the point when he I started researching the history where I was like, this Victor guy, I could really get along with him. He's cool. Well, so he goes back and he tries to reintegrate with the family business and there are disagreements happening. He's disagreeing with his father. Um, he wants photography to be a bigger part of the business, but there's just clashes with his vision and his father's management. So he just goes off on his own and he starts his own photo shop. A shop for photos. <laughs> and, and it has a photo lab in it. He starts it with his wife and they're very successful. And he starts publishing papers about technical aspects of photography and he becomes a well-known figure. He becomes known as someone who just knows a lot about cameras um, mechanically, and also photography as an art. He has this quote that I love. He says, I certainly don't think that we will earn much money on, on this, but at least it will allow us to take pictures for free. Yeah. <laughs> and I love that because he's, he's doing what he's passionate about. And then it worked out. Some people figure, try to figure out, well, what's the way I can make the most money? That's not ever going to work out for you if you're not also passionate about it. Yeah. So he just chased his dreams. Victor was on to something. Well, so this is all happening around the 1940s. And yeah, what big event happens World in Europe? Yeah. And at this point, Germany has invaded Denmark and Norway and Sweden is right there. So I would be very nervous, right? All the countries around them are being invaded and yeah. Sweden wasn't necessarily prepared. So they're kind of building up their army and um, the government goes to Victor and they say, can you make a huge aerial surveying camera for Sweden? Yeah, they want to do reconnaissance. They want to Mapping do reconnaissance. is super important. Reconnaissance was so important. I kind of, in my research, I kind of got sucked into the World War II stuff because I just am very interested in that. But the aerial reconnaissance imaging was so important that they were training people for weeks at a time just to teach them how to interpret the photos. 
And when people were good at that, they would be put on this task full time to interpret the photos and then 3D maps and, and very intricate maps would be made of the places that they were surveilling. It was thought to be one of the most important strategies during the war to have that technology to be able to look at your enemy. Um, so, of course, Sweden wants that technology. And they asked Victor if he can make one of these big cameras. And he says, I don't want to make a big camera. I want to make a little one. I want to <laughs> yeah. make a small one. Because the big ones are... They take two guys to carry. They're massive. You have to mount them on the plane just in the right way. Um, they're telephoto and they're huge. But Victor wants to make something smaller. So, to me, this sign, this is is a sign that he's more of a nerd than a business person, like because he's arguing with the government who's telling him, "Hey, we'll just build this for us. We need it for the war." And he's like, "I would rather do something slightly different." Yeah, he's like, "I like small cameras." So anyway, what settles the debate? Oh, a, a German plane crashes in Sweden. Yeah, the reconnaissance plane. Yeah. A reconnaissance plane. And they managed to recover a camera from the plane. And it's not a huge mounted plane, uh, a huge mounted camera. It's uh, what they call like a hand camera, which is still pretty big. It's still yeah. Quite big. HK. Um, but it's the one that Victor wanted to reconstruct. So they give the camera to Victor and he goes out and he makes a little workshop in an auto body shop next to a junkyard and he gets a mechanic and he gets someone else to help him uh, deconstruct, reverse engineer this camera and make one for the Swedish government. So at this point, you have to remember he doesn't work for his dad anymore. He's not a part of Hasselblad. This isn't the first Hasselblad camera. It's, it's a Ross camera. Mm -hmm. And uh, some technical aspects of it, like he's he, he decides to use uh, six by six film, medium format film. So this becomes their standard for a long time, the sort of square format. They get actually known for this. Uh, they have a problem. They don't make lenses. They make cameras. Yeah. And Germany still makes all the best lenses. So Sweden at this time is trying to stay out of World War II. And to a large extent, they actually succeed in remaining neutral. So they maintain a trade relationship with Nazi Germany. They're actually like Saab is providing them ball bearings and the government of Sweden is providing them steel like uh, or iron. iron. And, and they're doing the same thing with Great Britain. So Sweden is kind of playing both sides of this. And by the end of the war, Sweden does kind of take a side and starts helping out the allies a little bit more. Than but, the Nazis. But that relationship also enabled Victor to use Zeiss lenses. Yeah. So, so part he, of what they get back is these lenses from Germany. Yeah. They're putting a German lens on this camera that he's making. Wouldn't you think Germany would be like, hey, guys, what do you need these lenses for? He's like, yeah. nothing. <laughs> Portraits 400 feet away. Like, I don't know why someone wasn't onto that. Maybe they didn't care. Uh, so th the Air Force, the Swedish Air Force, came back to him with several revisions. He made his first camera. They wanted some slightly different things. For example, they wanted to be able to change just the lens in case they needed, in case weather conditions were different, they needed to fly lower. Maybe mm -hmm. they needed a wider angle lens. So he developed an interchangeable lens system for it. And then later they said, hey, we want to take pictures automatically on what we'd call an intervalometer. So what would that require? Might require different backs. So he's developed this interchangeable system with like a shutter system because it's using a focal plane shutter at this point, interchangeable lenses and interchangeable backs. And this same sort of interchangeable system is something that Hasselblad will stick with up until now. If you look at their current systems, they, they're using almost the same format, the same uh, and, and definitely the same values. I think their values came out of this relationship with the Swedish Air Force during World War II modularity, versatility, and reliability. Yeah, they had to make a very utilitarian camera. Yeah, and that's pretty much what they did. And I think, you know, they will have great commercial success with commercial photographers. And part of it is because of the conditions under which it was developed. I wanted to share a picture of him at this time because I was like, this guy's cool as heck. Everybody's going to want to see him. <laughs> Yeah, he's a pretty cool guy. So 1942, Carl Eric, Victor's father, passes away. Victor purchases the majority of the shares in the family company. Um, and then that's when the switch happens where these cameras that he's manufacturing 
take on the Hasselblad name. So Hasselblad made 342 cameras for the military between 1941 and 1945. Uh, but Victor's passion was always in wanting to build a, a consumer camera, something that could fit in his hand. So he had in mind, all right, I can't do this right now because the war is still going and I have to manufacture cameras for them. Um, but I can take the necessary steps towards my goal of making a smaller camera. So another thing that he starts manufacturing in his plant are watches and clocks because he figures that they'll need to get used to manufacturing a lot of things um, in a way that's like very efficient. And he also figures that the small mechanics will be a good way to train the technicians. So they build 70,000 watch and clock parts in a year. And he feels like that helped prepare them for making these smaller consumer cameras. And when I use a Hasselblad, it, I'm always reminded of that history of watch and clock parts because they feel like a fine watch. If you pick up one of the Japanese knockoffs, they don't feel the same way. The way they click and the movements of them are so precise and so perfect. Uh, labor in Sweden then and now has been way more expensive than it is in just about anywhere else in the world. So Hasselblad had, they had no choice but to choose the strategy of making high quality products and then charging more because they, they were never going to be, be the cheap option. They couldn't do that with expensive labor. I saw in an interview with Victor that he kept hiring away all of these technicians from another company and the company called them and was like, stop it. <laughs> and he was like, I'll stop hiring away your employees if you stop hiring mine. He was like, they thought that was kind of brazen, but they agreed to it. Uh -huh. So he had kind of sourced around for other technicians to help him build up this company. I thought it was cool. Can I make a modern day business analogy? He's, sure. he's building watch parts in preparation for making cameras. And it reminds me of what Elon Musk is doing. People, sometimes people don't understand why Elon Musk is making cars and solar cells. And now he's digging tunnels with the boring company. I did not understand the boring company. No, it doesn't make any sense Until if you hear about it. I heard he wants to do it on Mars for underground yes. transportation. Yeah, he's doing something that seems random. Like, I can't But he even... has a future. He's just building the pieces he needs to build a Mars colony, just like Victor here was building the, the skills and technologies he needed to make a fantastic camera. Yeah, and that's Victor's personality. He's a patient person. I mean, he's a wildlife photographer, and that requires patience and the ability to listen and observe. And that's what he's really good at. You can see that in his business too. Mm -hmm. um, he's very good at making a bigger plan and sticking to it and then making these incremental steps that don't necessarily even seem related. But he's patient enough to say, I, watches aren't my passion, but I'll make them for a year to get there. It, I find that incredible. So they made like 342 cameras for the military. They had about 20 employees. They're a small, small company at this point. Um, if you're watching, this is just a picture of a couple of Swedish Air Force dudes with one of their hand cameras, hand, the Hasselblad camera. hand cameras, uh, and a couple more pictures of just the different varieties of, they, they kept making different revisions over those 342 cameras uh, just to meet the demands of the Air Force. So these aren't mass production things. These are, we're going to hand build a few cameras um, according to very specific specs. Uh, and legend has it that Victor would test the cameras by taking pictures of birds. <laughs> <laughs> and he did. He kept his nerdiness, kept them, kept trying to steer the choice, the technology choices towards stuff that would help with birds. Like he wanted a focal plane shutter because focal plane shutters, not focal plane shutters, but a leaf shutter inside the lens, because at the time those were faster. So you could use faster shutter speeds and the Air Force didn't necessarily need that. So... He ultimately ended up using focal plane shutters, but he wanted to use those leaf shutters because birds. <laughs> there, you know, there there was a conversation. They were like, "Why?" And he was like, "No reason." Yes, you know, not birds. <laughs> uh, and this is a picture of one of their uh, Loss Ross Land cameras with a periscope on it. I just thought it was a super cool picture to find. The, the military would use these hand cameras and peer around windows and stuff. It's just a a large hand camera with a big periscope sticking out. <laughs> Oh, yeah. subtle. For those of you listening, it's pretty massive. <laughs> uh, so 1948, Hasselblad finally gets into the consumer camera business. And I found this really cute picture of what looks like a Cocker Spaniel. 
it's Victor's dog with their first camera, and the dog's name is Leica. Leica, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because he was just used to shooting Leica, so it's just funny that the founder of Hasselblad named his camera, his dog, after another camera company. Not the founder, but the dog, but... Uh, you're right. The, well, the founder of Hasselblad Cameras, yeah. really. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so they they launched these cameras in New York New City, York, the 1600F, yeah. and they start bringing in commercial photographers. And they manage to bring in commercial photographers and take great like fashion pictures and such. And it does kind of set the stage for what would be the long-term purpose of this. Now at this time, we have a lot of, we have Leica who's putting their cameras in the hands of photojournalists. Uh, that's not what they're doing. We have Nikon who's mostly ripping off Leica <laughs> and would eventually get into sports and stuff. It's a completely different segment. Hasselblad never tries to get into really photojournalism. They don't try to get into sports. I Oddly, they don't ever get into wildlife photography. I would have thought he would have made something, but they never really did. He would have wanted to. They have their segment. Um, this slide is unrelated, except that it's from an interview. <laughs> and the Swedes have a certain personality. And this... Tell me more. Uh, Victor, <laughs> well, especially, this is a Swedish, uh, like an anchorman. So it's the combination of kind of stiffness. And Victor tells a funny little anecdote. And this guy says in Swedish, yes, that is an amusing reminiscence with his hand on his chin. <laughs> Just, I what like Swedes it when are you talking about? Because we know Erki and he's a nonstop party train. I know, but Erki is an uncommon Swede. <laughs> <laughs> um. The, the anecdote that Victor told is with that 1600F, I think it was a 1600F, the day before he shows up in New York ready for the press conference the next day with yeah. one copy of the camera. Yeah. And whenever you are going to present something on stage, it's always super stressful because it always breaks. Well, the day before, uh, one of the techs is just getting it ready and his tie gets caught in the shutter, the, the focal plane yeah. shutter mechanism. And it, it gets all tangled up. It took an hour to get it out. It, yeah, exactly. And Thankfully, the camera worked the next day, probably because those things were super reliable. Like the Swedish Air Force always said, they said, oh man, we, we dropped this thing like several times, but it still seems fine. And that was Hasselblad's reputation. They Tony, were you need a Hasselblad. Well, I always want a Hasselblad. And then I, even no matter how old it was, no matter how beat it up it is, they're still expensive, but they are beautiful. I really do. I do want one. <laughs> um, 1952, the 500C. Yeah, another beautiful uh, camera. And uh, here's a shot from 1954. I, just a picture. I shouldn't include pictures in a podcast, but this is just a picture of Reinhold Heideck, uh, who was the leader of Roloflex at the time, and Victor. And uh, Reinhold has his Roloflex TLR, another famous camera that we'll have to cover at some point. And Victor has his little. 100f and they're taking pictures of each other and they're they at say Photo that Kina, right yeah they're at Photokina 1954 and they say that the two of them agreed to not compete with each other Hasselblad would never make a TLR a tin, twin lens reflex camera and ha uh, Rol Roloflex would never make a single lens reflex camera and SLR so just different camera designs but they decided and unfortunately for Roloflex, SLRs became popular and TLRs <laughs> had some fundamental kind of you know, he was mechanical like, problems. Oh, handshakes. Yeah. Handshakes were important back then. I can't even get, keep people to keep their promises now with a contract. No, you just can't. <laughs> and in 1960, it's a landmark year because Hasselblad finally makes a profit. Now, keep in mind, they've been making cameras for 20 years, but they're losing money. They're taking money from the trading business and putting it into the camera business, but it's a loss leader. And I have to think that Victor stuck with this despite the fact that he was losing money because he just loved it. Why else would you run a, a company that's losing business for 20 years? Because he had a passion and I think yeah. he truly believed that if he could get it to a certain point, then it would work. So 1960 was a big year, but then 1962 was, was a the huge biggest year. year. The yeah. year they still talk about. <laughs> yeah. A lot. Uh, maybe it was their peak. <laughs> I don't think that's polite. <laughs> well, from a marketing perspective, I mean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so in, in this year, the Hasselblad goes to space with the Apollo program. And it actually literally lands on the moon. 
You know what really surprised me about this? I think a lot of people know that Hasselblad was the first camera on the moon. But what really surprised me about it is that Victor did not know that his camera was going to the moon. He didn't know it was going to the moon until he saw pictures of his camera on the moon. Yeah, weird, That must right? have been a great day. It if literally... I woke up and saw SDP, our book on the moon, I would be like, whoa. <laughs> they they just let the astronauts pick their cameras, which seems crazy to me. Like nowadays, NASA so carefully vets everything for safety purposes. You know, we had, well, there was a fire a little bit later on. And at that point, they started to be a little more selective about the stuff they let astronauts bring on the rockets. They were like, what? But you brought time, a bong? Like, That's not smart. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah, you know, pick a camera out for yourself, whatever you like, whatever, whatever you can operate with gloves. And Hasselblad, wow. of course with their commercial and military background, they have like big buttons and dials and they still do. And they happen to be- Do you think that's why they clubs. chose it? I was wondering if one of the astronauts was like a history buff or something and or knew that it was a war camera and thought it was cool or- Yeah, I, I can't say for sure, but that's my hunch. Um, so I think it's a good hunch. Astronauts use them on uh, Apollo, the last two Mercury vo voyages and all 12 Gemini voyages and to this day, there are, I think, 12 of them on the moon because I guess they wouldn't bring them back. You know, they rude. Yeah, they would. I guess they would just grab their film and then ditch their camera. But man, I'd, if oh. I, I would definitely want to bring it back. Those astronauts are not do. real photographers. <laughs> if they can stand to leave Goodbye. their camera behind. Yeah. Uh, NASA requested an important modification. So at this, after that first launch, NASA starts to say, hey, maybe we can specialize these things a little bit. And specifically, they wanted a motor drive because I guess it might have been difficult to wind the film and everything. Mm -hmm. um, so Hasselblad creates the 500EL, which is the, like the first motor-driven camera. Up until then, you had like a big knob you had to just rink to advance the film each time. <laughs> Um, so that's kind of a landmark and this EL line would continue on up until like Hasselblad would be making EL cameras until 2006 with regular advancements to technology, of course, but this becomes just their most successful line in their entire history. And it came out of this kind of NASA request. Um, he's good at taking requests. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. In 1966, uh, astronaut Michael Collins, while doing a spacewalk, he uh, drops his camera. It wasn't tethered. That's another thing NASA is a little more careful about now. They they try to tether some stuff. They have they did actually lose a camera many years later when an astronaut was doing a spacewalk, spacewalk and forgot to tether it. But dude just dropped his Hasselblad in space, and so in all likelihood, it's still. What up there. happens? You chase it. <laughs> What's this? What's the situation? You know, watch Gravity. No, you can't just go chasing stuff. Oh, in space, not on the moon. No, yeah, he was in a, doing a space walk. Oh, that thing. And brought his camera real with him gone. As he would. Michael, come on. <laughs> uh, but Hasselblad made this cute little cartoon advertising, re requesting that space people keep an eye out for it so that maybe it can be returned to its owner. Uh, Hasselblad was definitely on this, like, we're going to market this, this space stuff. This moon stuff is pretty <laughs> people, cool. Yeah, at the time, I don't know if you remember, Chels, but in the 60s, people were super into oh, I remember. moonwalks in space. <laughs> <laughs> I watched. It was a big deal. I was like, wow, we're really there. Is this faked? Maybe. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> don't even start. Uh, let's take a moment to thank our sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace builds amazing websites for you. Yeah. Uh, all you do is provide the content. They provide the design. They make it work with mobile devices. They create your analytics. They can register your domain name for you. You can have a personalized, customized website, even if you don't have any technical skills, and it will work perfectly all the time. We have both have a Squarespace portfolio, and if you can drag and drop, you can build a Squarespace portfolio. You don't have to have a portfolio. You could be a musician, a designer, an artist, or have a restaurant. Squarespace will make it possible and make it easy. You can try it out today at squarespace.com slash Tony. Get your free trial. See if you like it. I think you're going to. And if you want to buy it, go to squarespace.com slash Tony and use the offer code portfolio to get 10% off. Yeah. Your Facebook, your Instagram, those are not good ways to show off your work. No, That's good ways to see your, your most recent work. Recent, but if you want people to land and see your most impressive work, right? Yeah. You can also set up a store, sell prints. I sell prints on a regular basis through my I Squarespace site. So think Squarespace. 1978, a sad moment. Um, oh. 
Victor takes his last photographic trip. He goes to the Galapagos chasing birds and then dies shortly thereafter. And I just feel a little sad about it because he was such a, a visionary, so inspired. He was so excited about the photography business. And at this point, it's time for somebody else to take over Hasselblad. And, and things definitely change for a long time at Hasselblad. You know, he was a, a really inspired visionary. Um, I wanted to show one more quote from an interview with him. He says, I see photos as pure documents. A photo should not be complicated. It should reflect, it should reflect reality. I can't understand the intermingling of art and photography. Your word guy, Victor. Yeah, that totally blew my <laughs> mind. It's just because his cameras uh, have created some of the most beautiful artistic images of all time. Also, some of the most fantastic documents from everything from birds to actually like the first pictures of the earth from the moon were taken with this Hasselblad. But I just I thought that was an interesting insight into his philosophy about photography. I think I like to think that we could have changed his mind had we been able to hang with Victor. You started as purely documenting with your photography. Yeah, that was my initial You inclination. documented compulsively when you first started, and yeah. there really wasn't much art to it. You just yeah. compulsively took pictures like Victor of birds also, and then the art just developed over the years. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely so. made that transition, and Victor, <laughs> even in his older days, was still like, this is for documenting stuff. Stop with the art. I was like, oh. <laughs> okay. So... Hasselblad continues on, and all through the 1980s, they are working with the most famous photographers, creating images of the most famous celebrities. Dimitri Castorine uses a Hassie to shoot Johnny Cash. David Michael Kennedy shoots Debbie Hare. Uh, Greg Gorman shoots Grace Jones. All the all the famous Very names famous from model. the 80s, yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, but they're all shot with Hassies, and that's what Hasselblad becomes known for. And it's it. That makes photographers of that style reach for a Hasselblad. If they can't afford it, it's what they want. Yeah, that's what all of the famous people are being shot with. That's what all of the best photographers are using on those types of shoots. That's what they become known for. So I, I don't want to cover every single incremental camera. They kept making slightly new cameras using the same format, the same lenses, supporting yeah. that same system, and people keep using them. I think the the next noteworthy step in the camera development is in 1998, they develop a relationship with Fuji, Fuji Film, And they kind of do a knockoff version of a Fuji camera called the X-Pan. And it's a 35 millimeter camera, their first 35 millimeter camera. But it uses three exposures, basically, side by side to create one long panoramic image with no breaks in it. It's a very cool little camera. I've played with one before. That's... When did you do that? I'm jealous. Long back in the film era, I just had a friend who had one. So it makes these huge uh, 35 millimeter, still not, it's not medium format, but it's bigger. And then the next big development comes in 2002. They released their H system, which a lot of, especially commercial photographers are still using today. And uh, part of this comes from that same Fuji partnership. They have Fuji making the lenses and the prisms. The prism, the thing that bounces the lights up to your eye because it's and still an SLR system. Um, but Hasselblad takes most of the credit for it anyway. Uh, they switch away from their square format to a 645 format that's like six centimeters by 4.5 centimeters. Um, and that, that changing in aspect ratio is a big deal. You know, at, at the time, I think people started printing a lot in 8x10 magazines were becoming really, really popular. And so I think it yeah. made sense to crop off a little bit, use the space a little more efficiently. If, if everybody's cropping anyway, you can get a little more out of the lens by going to a different aspect ratio. But that aspect ratio also changes your style. It changes the vision of the photographers. 645 to six by six, that's kind of a, a big deal. Um, and, but the H system wasn't really designed to be digital, uh, which, is weird in 2002. It was still like their first camera it was just a film camera. Hmm. It also supported autofocus. So it wasn't digital, but these cameras were popular and digital was becoming more and more popular, especially in the commercial world where the workflow benefits were huge. You could see your results instantly without fussing with Polaroids. You could uh, get something to print faster. So people wanted to be digital and other companies started filling this in. And a lot of this information, I have to thank my friend Kevin Raber for it, because Kevin made uh, an amazing article detailing 
the history of Hasselblad. So everybody should check out Luminous Landscape, the website, and go through all of Kevin's stuff. Kevin especially is incredibly his. knowledgeable. Yeah. And he worked, well, was he the president of phase one or he was high up in phase one for a long, long time. So phase one, Sinar Leaf and several other companies made digital backs for this H1 system instead of Hasselblad. And that's kind of a big deal because Hasselblad is making most of it, but then somebody else is putting the most expensive bits on and <laughs> getting most of the money. So Hasselblad, there's not, they're not exactly thrilled about it, uh, but they don't really have like the sensor technology and they're kind of hard up for cash. Uh, and in 2003, they get acquired by a Japanese company. And I don't know that I can pronounce this correctly. S H R I R O Shiro. And they'd been a distributor for Hasselblad throughout a lot of Asia. And then they just like straight up bought Hasselblad, which is, it's good. You know, it's still a Swedish company. Like everything's, the action's happening in Sweden. Yeah. But now they're owned by a Japanese company. And in 2004, that same Japanese company buys Imicon, which makes scanning equipment. And they kind of merge Imicon and Hasselblad together. And as a result of that, Hasselblad's able to reach release the H1D. So they're kind of pushing them into the digital era. Yeah. So now Hasselblad suddenly can make sensors. They can make their own proper digital backs for their whole system. Uh, and as part of that, they decide they're going to try to block out other manufacturers. So phase one can't just make a back that will snap on to the H1D. Uh, they want it all. Right. But it, it, that's a choice that a lot of photographers are mad about because photographers have learned to love their phase one backs. Yeah. And they wanted to keep using a phase one back with this new camera. They didn't want to necessarily use the Imicon back. So there was a little bit of a rebellion. And as a result, a lot of photographers ended up switching, especially to Mamiya, who was making competing cameras. And uh, I think, I, I don't know how to assess who'd been doing better. Mamiya certainly, I think at this point, Mamiya might have started outselling them in that market, but I, I couldn't find hard numbers about it. Um, I will also say during this period of time, it was a difficult time for these companies. Uh, Contax and Bronica making competing cameras, they just closed. Um, Rolly and Pentax were really suffering in the, like the medium format markets. It was just a tough business to be in. Uh, but Hasselblad does start collecting royalties from companies that want to make compatible backs. So basically they'll sell you a license to be able to connect to the camera. So at least okay, they start to get a sense. piece of it. Yeah. The prices of the phase one backs as a result have to kind of go up to give Hasselblad their yeah. piece of the pie. Yeah, the consumer ends but, up paying anyway. Yeah, at least photographers are still able to use the gear that they want. 2010. <laughs> yeah, they stick, Hasselblad sticks a uh, Ferrari logo on a bright red camera. Victor would have been like. And then tax $10,000 the, extra under the price in H4D. Victor would have been like, oh, we're doing this. Let's make one with a bird on it. <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of thought the same thing. I thought, I don't know that Victor would be down with a Ferrari no, guys. H4D. Victor wouldn't have been cool with that. Uh, it looks cool, though. It it does look cool. I mean, I want one. Yeah, I, <laughs> I mean, definitely do. if they gave me a free one, I'd be happy. Uh, How much does it cost? I don't know what the H4D was at the time, but it was an extra 10K on top of that. You were paying 10K for the red paint so, and the logo. <laughs> oh, they have champagne? <laughs> yeah. How much for that? Is it Ferrari champagne? Anyway, it's fancy. <laughs> it's a fancy toy for rich people. In 2011, a company, a private equity firm called Ventus buys Hasselblad. So they're okay. kind of being passed around again because they need cash. Like they're, yeah. they're bleeding cash at this point. They're back to losing money. But after Ventus gets them, we start to see some real stuff go down, like the Lunar, the Hasselblad Lunar. Yeah, I feel bad about this one because I feel like the internet was pretty rough on Hasselblad about this. Yeah, it's go ahead and you know, go to DP Review and look up the Hasselblad Lunar. And just see what people have to people say. People aren't like, they never try to put themselves in someone else's shoes and understand. A lot of judgment went down with this. The, the Hasselblad Lunar was a Sony NEX 7, which 
the NAX7 is like the A6500 just back yeah. in 2012. And the NAX7 cost uh, 1350 bucks, and the Lunar cost $7,000. Yeah. And it was the same camera, but they put a nice, a very nice wood grip on it. It does look pretty. Wrote Hasselblad. Yeah, it is I've very gotten pretty. to play with them and I'm like, oh, I like that grip, but it's still it's a it's a fifteen hundred dollar. Very expensive. Camera. But um I can see why this is happening to Hasselblad, because another company is taking it over. The maybe the original vision of the camera company is a little bit lost and they're trying to figure out how to get some money out of the company. And so they're using the name and the value of the name to try to generate some money. Yeah, they are literally just selling little chunks of their credibility. They repeat this again in 2013 with the Stellar, the 2014, they rebrand a Sony Alpha 99 and then there's the Stellar too. So they keep rebranding these Sony cameras. I just wanted to re read some of the comments. Uh, Victor is rolling in his grave. Oh, I know. Don't act like you know Victor, Mel. <laughs> Even though we just said the same thing pretty much. I, I know Victor. Dear Hasselblad, your company is a brothel and your prostitutes are the cameras that you stick lipstick and eyeliner on. Could you people please go away? That is so rude. Yeah, but I just wanted to show the reaction that the f photography community had to these rebranded cameras. And the photography community up until this point adored Hasselblad, myself included. And then you see these rebranded Sonys come out where they just charge three, four times more. It's It feels insulting to mm -hmm. people. What is Hasselblad smoking? 7K for a rebadged re NEX7? Must be the joke of the decade, another commenter on, on DP Review. Uh, and Tell us how you really feel. <laughs> Uh, here we see Larry Hansen, the CEO of Hasselblad at the time, uh, with the Lunar and Neil Armstrong, <laughs> who I can't believe got involved in this mess. Uh, so, but things turn around. In 2014, they replace him as CEO and sue him. What? Larry? Yeah, for wrongful and negligent conduct. For Because of that camera? Yeah, for lo for destroying the Hasselblad brand that they had been building for decades since World War II. They'd been building this prestigious Larry brand. Larry took the fall for that? I, I could not find how the lawsuit was finally settled, but they did sue him. And to me, it was such a, a breath of fresh air to hear Hasselblad be like, this this was not a good call. <laughs> we we didn't, I know we did this, but we we didn't like it. Poor Larry, though. Yeah. Sorry, bro. Um, so Hasselblad still needs money. It's still struggling to support itself. <laughs> they they uh, they found somebody already. I hate oh. to break it to you. They're they're off the market. It's not uh, Larry, definitely. <laughs> the new CEO knows that they need to develop a new camera system or more modern camera camera system. He wants to develop a mirrorless camera, what would eventually become the Hasselblad X one D. Yes, and I love that idea because Victor, that's what he wanted. He small. always wanted a small camera yeah. to fit in the consumer's hand. But it's expensive to build a camera, right? So where are you going to get the money? He starts looking around once again for basically a buyer, somebody who can give them an influx of cash that will allow them to do the R&D so that they can sell this camera so they can make more money. It's a cycle that starts with money. And the company that provides it in 2015 is DJI. I... When I started learning about the history, I thought this was so cool because Hasselblad cameras started in the air and it's all come full circle and they're on drones and in the air again. Yeah, That's DJI, cool. a Chinese drone company who was basically printing cash. <laughs> they sell a lot of product and they bought, bought a minority stake in 2015 and then in 2017, they bought a majority stake. Though nobody will technically, I can't find anybody to officially verify that. It's a private company, so they don't have to necessarily file stuff. But it seems, Kevin Raber says they bought a majority oh, stake. What? Can you just quote Kevin Raber like that? Yeah, I can definitely quote him. He wrote a whole article about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought like maybe he told you when we met him personally. Oh. oh, oh I, I bought Kevin Raber a glass of wine. We definitely talked he... about it, but <laughs> no, it's, it's, He's made it public, but nobody has actually verified it. So I just wanted to qualify. Okay. That I Kevin's Kevin. my source. I trust Kevin. But I do trust Kevin. He definitely seems to know what's going on. Um, and out of this partnership, you see them putting some drones on uh, 
DJ or cameras on DJI drones. You see the A six D one hundred C. So they do start to work together, start making aerial cameras. Once again, it seemed out of place, but once you understand their history that they came from this, it actually is kind of a perfect fit. Do you think Victor's would be happy about it, or do you think he'd be like this again? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think the only thing that would make Victor happier is if they made a a bird photography camera. <laughs> if they just made like a twelve hundred millimeter lens for the Hasselblads. Uh, and in in twenty seventeen, they do finally launch the X one D, their little mirrorless camera, and the photography community has been in love with it. I I haven't spent a lot of time with it. I've played with it. It feels fantastic it feels like a hassle lad it feels perfect it feels uh, polished and refined exactly what you would expect from a company like Hasselblad they still need some more lenses they only have a couple of lenses out but keeping in mind that they their previous system started in 2002 and is still going strong and before that the system uh, that uh, 500EL system went for like 50 years or something. Yeah. <laughs> it's a long-term thing with Hasselblad. It's good. I expect the X1D to be around for a long time. And over that, those decades, we will get a plenty big lens selection. So I, I think it's something that, that we can invest in, especially once you understand the history of Hasselblad, it makes me want some Hasselblad products. It um, really does. I think we should try to get them to send us that camera and then we can take a bird picture for Victor. Oh, that's sweet. I think you would like that. Uh, I do want to back up to 2016 just because I thought they did something interesting. They made a camera that snapped onto the back of the Motorola Moto smartphone because it has interchangeable backs. And it was just an interesting move that I was like, whoa, 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 whoa wait, what? Well, well. <laughs> to make a smartphone uh, snap on camera from this company that's famous for making huge commercial cameras and sending stuff to the moon. Um, it, you know, it got mixed reviews, but I think it was the type of innovation that I'd like to see from a company that's going to be successful. And a lot of camera companies are trying to find a way to move into the modern yeah. smartphone photography era. Uh, and Hasselblad, I think, figured out the best solution. I hope that we see more cool stuff from them. Uh, it only works with the one Motorola, Mola, Motorola Moto smartphone. So you don't see a lot of them out and about. Yeah, no, I don't even know that phone is uh, a thing. And I also thought it was interesting on the Hasselblad website where they advertise this, they show it side by side with the pictures from the moon. What's that? So they're still leveraging the lunar landing in their that marketing material. that happened, Tony, and it was awesome. Yeah. And no, I, I think that's fine because you don't just buy a Hasselblad as for the specs. You buy it to participate in that history and yeah. you want a piece of that history and they are inseparable and the history of the company is amazing. So I think that brings us up to the current date. Uh, I am excited about Hasselblad. I can't wait to see what happens next. I do want to cite a whole bunch of sources. Yeah, these are, thank uh, you everyone. We have got information from a lot of different places. Yeah, especially HasselbladHistorical.eu had a ton of information, uh, and Hasselblad's YouTube channel, you should subscribe to their yeah, YouTube channel. Yeah, their YouTube channel. channel had some great interviews with Victor. And of course, thank you to our sponsor, Squarespace, which makes awesome websites available to you. If you're interested in your own website, visit squarespace.com slash Tony. You'll get a free trial. You can see if you like it. No credit card so you'll required. You'll like it. No credit card. You'll like it. And when you do, use the coupon code PORTFOLIO to get 10% off and let them know that you heard about it from this podcast. Thanks. I'm so sad that we're not talking about Victor anymore. <laughs> I just really want to go back to it. He went to the Galapagos, too. That was cool. I know. He's... Victor was awesome. Oh, I miss Victor. Uh, I miss him so much. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> thanks, Victor, and thanks to Squarespace. Bye.